Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, we are living, I think, in a time of more than usual flux, as all the major powers in our region, the US, China, and Japan, uh, adjust their relationships with each other and with countries in the region. For us in ASEAN, probably the key strategic issue is how to position ourselves in the mix of this flux. And this is not as obvious as you may think it may be because the relationships between these three major powers are not simple ones and defy easy characterization. Uh, they are interdependent in a way which I think at least is unprecedented and yet is also characterized by deep strategic mistrust. Uh, perhaps the contestation, as the title of this panel uh, suggests, is one element of these relationships, but only one element. You can't reduce it to just rivalry or competition or contestation. Perhaps because it's so difficult to characterize this relationship, there is a tendency, at least I think there is one, among in the media, certainly, in fact, in some academic circles too, to oversimplify it by reference to what I think are inappropriate historical analogies. For example, you know, there's sometimes talk of a new Cold War between the US and China. Yet, I think US-China relations are far more complicated than US-Soviet relations ever were. Um, certainly, it was possible to conceive and quite successfully contain the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union largely contained itself by pursuing autarky. But China is such a vital node in the world economy, containment, if that was US policy, and I don't think it is, is impossible. Now ASEAN finds itself, and the same could be said about US-China-Japan China, uh, China -Japan relations. Now ASEAN finds itself at the center of these currents and not for the first time. In fact, in a sense, since 1967, the fundamental purpose of ASEAN is to provide a mechanism that will allow the small states of Southeast Asia, and even the largest of us are small compared to the US, China, or Japan, uh, to preserve some modicum of autonomy. Uh, and we do this by trying to promote balance in Southeast Asia. Not balance in a Cold War sense as being directed against one country or another country, but balance as a kind of omnidirectional state of equilibrium that will allow us to have the best possible relationship with all the major powers without having to make invidious choices. Now, sometimes we do this better than other times, and it's becoming more difficult to promote balance in this sense. Well, because the strategic environment has become more complex, because ASEAN has become more complex, and because all three major powers, at least in my view, despite what they say, and they swear blind they're not doing it, are actually seeking a privileged relationship with ASEAN vis-a-vis -vis the other two. Uh, this is clear when you see, when you take the South China Sea issue, for example, which has emerged as something of a proxy for these adjustments underway. In any case, you are not here to listen to me, and we are fortunate to have a very distinguished panel to enlighten us on these complexities. Uh, I don't think Professor Shirk, Dr. Nishara, or uh, Professor Jia needs any introduction. And for those of you who have been living on Mars for the last few years, their bios, in any case, are in the material. Uh, so I will start by perhaps with Professor Shirk. Uh, each will have 10 to 12 minutes to make a presentation, and then we'll open it up for questions. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is my first time to participate in this forum, and I'm so pleased to have the opportunity. Um, so glad that I was invited to Singapore for this. It's a great chance to uh, learn more from, especially from Southeast Asian colleagues. Is it okay? You can either speak from the podium or you can speak from the I want to make sure that I've got the mic positioned well. So the Obama administration has devoted more attention to Southeast Asia 
than any U.S. administration since the uh, Vietnam War. And we, I'm, I'm very pleased about this. I think that Southeast Asia did not get enough attention from the United States up until the Obama administration. And of course, we see the Obama administration concluding with this unprecedented meeting at Sunnylands that will occur in February between the leaders of the countries of Southeast Asia and the United States. So the President Obama's initiative to call this meeting uh, in Sunnylands, and by the way, I was just at Sunnylands last week for a, a meeting, and um, I'm sure it's going to be the atmosphere at Sunnylands, which of course uh, worked its magic on the U.S.-China relationship when President Obama and Xi Jinping met, that it, met there, um, will also have a very positive effect on U.S.-Southeast Asian relations when the leaders meet there next month. Um, Tom Donilon made this uh, increased attention, the former National Security Advisor Tom Donilon explicitly said back in 2013 that the U.S. is not only rebalancing to the Asia-Pacific, but we are rebalancing within Asia to recognize the growing importance of Southeast Asia. So this is a very explicit policy. Obama administration came into office with this intention and they successfully um, implemented it. And it's important to point out that they came into office with this intention before the world started paying attention to uh, China's increasing assertiveness in Asia. It was not intended to be a policy to um, balance China. And only after China's behavior in relation to maritime sovereignty issues in the East China Sea and South China Sea started causing serious concerns in Asia that Asian countries came to the United States, said, please, can't we exercise together? Can't we offer you some ways to refuel? Uh, can't we, uh, we want to make sure to anchor the U.S. presence in the region because the China threat, which had really, uh, I'd say, to a certain extent, diminished as a concern for Southeast Asia as a result of China's uh, very successful regional diplomacy over several decades. The China threat became viewed as a much more acute problem due to China's elevation of these sovereignty issues over its own national security. So only at that point does this new focus on Southeast Asia really become, the China factor becomes much more important. And um, in my little paper, I talk a little bit about the shift in Chinese policy and why I think it occurred, but I'm gonna skip over that here to focus on um, US policy. But, uh, you know, with a rising power like China, there's always great uncertainty about its intentions. We know something about China's increasing capabilities and even with slower growth, we uh, anticipate a China which is economically and militarily uh, stronger in the future. But the question of China's intentions is really quite uncertain and that, that is why China's elevation of these sovereignty disputes, paying greater attention to them, uh, caused great alarms from Southeast Asian countries and from the United States because it appeared to signal that China was going to pursue its selfish uh, territorial interests over, and would be risk acceptance, was willing to uh, take risks to pursue these sovereignty objectives, even at the price of constant friction with its neighbors. 
So uh, that is a statement about China's intentions, which cause great concerns. Now, of course, the Chinese government continued to talk about the importance of cultivating friendly relations, had big meetings about periphery diplomacy, but there was a wide gap, and there continues to be a wide gap between its rhetoric and behavior. And I think it's important to point out what a problem this is for China's own diplomacy in Southeast Asia. Because when a country is pursuing its own selfish sovereignty claims, it's pretty hard to build a coalition around that. But the United States, on the other hand, has no such selfish interests uh, related to territory, and instead, it's calling for public goods of freedom of navigation, respect for international law. And that's how you build a coalition around those values and public goods. So then the question is, how can Southeast Asia, in fact, all of Asian countries, uh, encourage China to pursue a policy that is uh, aimed at providing public goods of cooperation, uh, freedom of navigation, respect for international law. And I think the uh, multilateral institutions of ASEAN and of other regional multilateral institutions are very important. The the fact that China is surrounded by 20 neighbors, more neighbors than any other country other than Russia, is both an opportunity and a constraint when it comes to Chinese foreign policy. And what I think the United States would hope to see, and what I think many Southeast Asians would also hope to see, is that this multilateral architecture can be strengthened in a way that both integrates China and helps shape China's intentions and behavior in the future. And let me just quickly mention a couple of ways in which I think collective action in the regional multilateral architecture could be improved. Um, and I don't want this to sound like this is some great American scheme. I'm hopeful that these are notions that are being discussed in Asian capitals as well. For one thing, how to um, enable ASEAN plus the broader regional architecture to uh, act in a concerted manner without China's ability to come and block a consensus by having one or two countries who are very economically dependent upon it kind of veto the collective action. I think it's worth discussing whether or not it might be time to consider uh, revising the voting rules of ASEAN and other regional uh, organizations so that unanimity might be limited to certain very important issues, but some kind of qualified majority voting might be used for other types of issues. Certainly that's how things work in Europe, and I think it's something worth considering in Asia. I would also hope that China itself would be at the forefront of trying to make uh, ASEAN and other regional organizations have more binding rules so that if China shows that it's willing to tie its own hands through regional rules and norms, it can reassure its neighbors and other countries um, that its intentions are benign. That's, uh, John Eikenberry makes this argument about the U.S. with global institutions after World War II, and I think it's a lesson that could be well learned by China in the regional setting. So I think I'll end right there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I'll give the floor to uh, Professor Chia, and Dr. Nishiara, you will have the last word. Professor Chia. 
Well, thank you very much. It's a great uh, uh, privilege uh, to be invited and to uh, speak here. Uh, my assignment is to uh, identify two priorities of China uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, I think one of the top priorities of China in Southeast Asia uh, remains to cultivate a positive, mutually beneficial relationship with the region. Okay. President Xi Jinping made the point in his address to the Foreign Affairs Conference of the CCP uh, 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 Central Committee uh, in, 19, uh, in 2014. He said, among other things, uh, China should uh, build an amicable, tranquil, prosperous neighborhood and development of a community of common destiny. This is particularly true as China reaches a point at which its previous type of economic growth becomes increasingly unattainable. Its security position is eroding with offensive realism both in, in and out of China, urge China and the US governments to adopt measures which may bring uh, the two countries into the so-called Lucidity's trap. And as Chinese government leaves behind the old dictum of Deng Xiaoping, such as hiding one's light and embraces and even seeks opportunities to shine and lead in international affairs. The logic is simple. To begin with, as Chinese economy grew rapidly, production costs, uh, land, labor, and environment in China also rose rapidly. Now it is reaching a point at which it can no longer rely on its previous type of economic growth, which depends on import of foreign capital technologies and managerial skills on the one hand, and export of cheap processed industrial products on an increasing scale on the other. In the process, China's comparative advantage has changed from one of cheap labor and production costs to capital, technologies, and managerial skills. It is against this background the Chinese government began to take the initiative of One Belt, One Road, which can be interpreted as open policy version two. Okay. That is, instead of relying on importing capital technologies and managerial skills for domestic development, China increasingly finds it in its interest to export capital technologies and managerial skills for further development. To implement this new strategy of development, China needs to develop good relations with Southeast Asia, which is the region uh, one belt, one road is most likely to take place and has the greatest potential. In the second place, as China rises, the realists argue that China and the United States, the rising power and the established power, are destined to head for conflict and war. Although this claim needs further test, uh, one, many in the world do subscribe it it has generated much suspicion and distrust between China and the United States. In order to address such challenge, President Xi proposed China and the United States build a new type of great power relations. If China is to convince the US that the new type of great power relations is going to work, the way it handles its relationship with Southeast Asia is of critical importance. Finally, for China to realize its ambition to play a leadership role in the world affairs, China needs to begin with the region that is closest to, to it. Whether China can be a benign world leader depends on how it manages its relationship with its neighbors. If China can find a way to satisfy its neighbors in its pursuit of its own interests, this would set a good precedent in world, for, for the world to accept the so-called Chinese leadership. Therefore, cultivating good relations with Southeast Asian countries is one of China's top priorities for the region. 
It is required for economic, security, and political reasons. If one wishes to identify another priority of China in Southeast Asia, it may be Chinese efforts to defend its maritime claims in, South, in the South China Sea. Over the past few years, China has developed, devoted a lot of resources to reaffirm its claims. It has contested the Huangyan or Scar Scarborough Island uh, shore with the Philippines, deployed oil rigs in the Xisha Islands, and built four islands in the Nansha or Spratly area, despite protests from the concerned countries. Chinese activism in this regard has generated much international attention. Many argue that this betrays China's true intention to engage in external expansion at the, at the expense of others, and challenge the international order. They argue that the world must stop China now before it becomes unstoppable. The real situation, however, is much more complicated. To begin with, to be fair, China is not the first country that has built islands in the area. Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, uh, all conducted such kind of activities in the South China Sea. Japan and South Korea had their own islands to build in the East China Sea. Um, when, when China you know, called shelf, shel shelving the disputes and engaging in joint exploration of resources for decades, uh, these countries con you know, did these things. And the US and other countries did not protest such kind of actions. Moreover, China has long successful track record of settling territorial disputes with its neighbors. It has resolved most of its land border problems and, and also uh, some maritime border issues with its neighbors through negotiation. This is an achievement that often escapes people's attention when they talk about the South China Sea maritime disputes. Thirdly, China never challenges the principle of freedom of navigation in the high seas, as uh, some Americans claim. In fact, it has made efforts to defend the principle by sending warships to protect the sea lanes in the Gulf of Eden. It only challenges, challenged the alleged unfriendly acts close to China's coast, such as US reconnaissance activities. China regards such kind of practice and abuse of the principle of freedom of navigation in the high seas. Finally, it is unfair to claim that China is engaging in international expansion. In fact, despite its proactivism, what China claims in the South China Sea today is what it has claimed for decades. China did not do much in the old days because China was weak. China became, becomes much more proactive nowadays, in part because its other claimants have been active over time, and because China now has acquired more capabilities to afford to be more proactive. Following the more proactive efforts on the part of China to enforce its maritime claims in recent years, the US and other countries joined forces to criticize China. The US even sent warships and fighter planes and encouraged other countries to do so in, in order to make this point. Under the circumstances, Chinese naturally feel that the US behavior is unfair and unjust. It is unfortunate that people tend to focus China's second priority over the first priority. As people make Chinese efforts to enforce its long-term maritime claims as a litmus test, to China's strategic intentions, they ignore that China's long-term track record of successful handling of its border disputes with its neighbors in history, and Chinese efforts to develop cooperation with its neighbors. This is not to say that we should ignore what, what is going on in the South China Sea. No, it is to be taken seriously and managed carefully. I think Given the complexity as well as seriousness of this issue at hand, 
we should be patient and give more time to the concerned parties to reflect on what their, their interests, real interests are. I think as far as China is concerned, uh, access is probably, securing access is probably more important than settling territorial disputes. I believe that it is the best interest of both China and ASEAN countries to develop some kind of institutional arrangement to manage the disputes peacefully, and ultimately, the concerned parties uh, will do so if they reflect on their true, what the true interests are uh, without becoming too emotionally. China should focus on, uh, China and these countries probably uh, as a start should take the COC negotiations more seriously and strive at an early conclusion. Uh, I believe that uh, if they can do so, uh, this problem can be successful, su successfully managed. Thank you very much. Thank you. In fact, you have one minute more. So, as an act of magnanimity, Dr. Nishihara, you have 13 minutes. One minute from China. Uh, you have the floor. Can I go over to that, the Rostam? Please. That... Up to you. Well, I thought I would uh, stand up because the friends on this side may not be able to see me or see us uh, on the stage. I would like to uh, talk about uh, roughly three points uh, in this limited time. First point, I would say, is Southeast Asia is becoming a more important geostrategically uh, for Japan, Japan security. Uh, its importance is really becoming greater today. Prime Minister Abe is particularly active in this area. He has visited all of the ASEAN, 10 ASEAN countries within the first two, office, two years office uh, since he became prime minister. In fact, he has visited about 60 countries around the world. Uh, so he's quite uh, active in that sense. Uh, why we think the South Asia is becoming more important? First of all, uh, the Japan's oil routes, uh, import routes, are from the, from the Middle East, come through the Strait of Malacca and also the South China Seas. Uh, therefore, uh, these long and secure sea lines along the politically troubling Asia, and uh, ancient continent, not only ensures the security of Northeast Asia, uh, Japan, South Korea, and in fact, uh, China as well. Japanese secure access to the oil route not only supports uh, Japanese economy and defense activities, but also supports the U.S. Uh, uh, state forces stationed in Japan and Korea that require access to energy resources as well. This helps maintain the uh, balance of power in uh, Asia Pacific, favorable to Japanese U.S. alliance and the Korea U.S. alliance. This is the first point I wish to make. Uh, second point I would like to make is that the Japan and China, uh, uh, the competition that would affect the security in the region. Uh, Japanese, Chinese rivalry stimulates today Japan's to become more engaged in, in ASEAN matters. Japanese government is comfortable in working with the ASEAN governments. Since the mid 1990s, Japan has developed difficult relations with China uh, over a series of political issues. A current outstanding issue between uh, Japan and China is the China's claims over the Senkaku Islands or Daiyodu Island and its growing military presence in the East and China Sea, uh, South China Sea uh, Seas. Japan considers ASEAN as a political partner to hedge against China, if possible, and uh, work with ASEAN and the United States to press on China to comply with the international rule of law uh, and the respect of the uh, rule of law. Uh, 
It is therefore important, vitally important for ASEAN to ensure the safety of the citizens for many other neighboring countries. Japan and China also disagree on the interpretation of Asian history uh, during World War II. Japan, China, uh, excuse me, China uses Japan's militaristic past as a political means to downgrade Japan. And this is a difficult political issue we face. Anti-Japan education within a, with, uh, with anti-Japan TV dramas often we see in Chinese uh, TV stations also prominent in China. Uh, it denounces Japan's desire to achieve a permanent seat in the UN Security Council. ASEAN countries do not talk much about, uh, do not talk about Japan in those terms. Only the Chinese and the Koreans today talk about this. Japanese feel therefore comfortable with Asian countries. Political tensions between Japan and uh, China also caused the more explicit rivalry in economic fields. In September 2015, last year, two countries fiercely competed to gain an in-nation in order for a, a construction of a high-speed train system between Jakarta and Bandun. Japan lost the case, but even more uh, harsher or serious competition has developed over China's Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Japan has chosen not to join the, uh, the bank. Uh, instead, Prime Minister Abe announced in May last year uh, that Japan was willing to provide $110 billion for the following five years uh, for the construction of, uh, of, excuse me, for investment of infra infrastructure uh, in, in the region. So it is larger than the amount that AIIB plans to collect from its member, members for one belt, one road. Uh, however, there are many areas that require joint work between Japan and China. Climate change, uh, infectious disease, natural disaster, uh, and tsunami, and so forth. Uh, the particularly important is the safety of Asian seasons I talked about. Both Japan and China, I mean other countries depend on the safety of, of seasons. Japan is an active uh, member of ARF, ADMM Plus, and East Asia Summit, and so forth. The last point I wish to make is about the uh, active Japanese security role, uh, which is emerging in the Southeast Asian area. Abe government is more conscious than any other government in the past that Japan should share international responsibility for regional security. The new security legislation of Japan uh, will allow its defense forces to play a more active role in supporting its ally and its partners. Japan is not willing to uh, uh, play a direct combat role but it's in, it is interested in playing a larger non-combat military role. I should like to emphasize this larger uh, non-combat military role, as well as political and economic role in the region. It has provided patrol vessels to the Philippines and Vietnam. It has engaged in capacity building for the military forces of ASEAN countries through joint exercises for humanitarian support and natural disaster, for example. Japanese Maritime Safety Defense Forces also plans to have its uh, reconnaissance planes fuel, refuel in Cameron Bay in Vietnam on the way back from, from their anti-piracy missions in Somalia. Japanese access to the bay, Cameron Bay, uh, was agreed upon in November last year when Defense Minister Nakatani visited Hanoi. They may also conduct joint naval exercises with ASEAN countries in the region. This way, Japan can support the security role in the South China Seas. So in conclusion, uh, Japan can, seeks, supports, uh, 
uh, ASEAN's economic viability and a political stability. Japan and ASEAN uh, countries are likely to form closer partnership uh, this year, a network of big partners who support the rule-based regional and international order. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, about 23 minutes for question and answers from the audience. But before I open the floor, I would like to set a frame, as it were, our three panelists to answer a question of mine. And you have to answer in one word only. <laughs> uh, um, do you think there is certainly competition between the US, China, and Japan in Southeast Asia? Do you think that the probability of com competition turning into conflict is low, medium, or high? You only have one word. Professor Shirk. Medium. Dr. Nishara? When you talk about the US China. <laughs> low, medium, or high? Oh, <laughs> conflict. I'll say medium. <laughs> medium. <laughs> Good. That was the answer I wanted. I did not want anybody to say hi. And with that as a frame, the floor is now open. Please uh, identify yourself unless you are Dr. Professor Tomiko, which needs your identification before you ask your question. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Um, this is a very uh, wonderful panel. I'd like to warmly welcome my, my good friend Su Chen Shirt to, to this forum. Um, I'd like to ask each of them a very short question, if I may. Um, Susan, I agree very much with your point that the Obama administration has devoted more attention to Southeast Asia than any previous administration. And he has also elevated our relationship to a strategic relationship. Um, looking forward to the forthcoming summit between the United States and ASEAN in Sunnyland, California, what is the one deliverable that you w w wish for that will consolidate the relationship between the United States and ASEAN? And uh, the, my question for Professor Chia is that um, I was rather encouraged by your narrative on the South China Sea, especially when you said we need a new institutional arrangement between China and ASEAN to manage this, and you urge the early conclusion of the Code of Conduct. I, I was very encouraged because the perception is that up to now, the Chinese have been dragging their feet in negotiation, the Code of Conduct. So could you amplify your remarks? I, I, I hope that um, what you just said will lead to a change in the thinking of the, my friends in Beijing. Um, Professor Ishihara, very happy to see you too. We were very happy when the, um, Japan and South Korea recently concluded an important agreement on the comfort of women. And my question to you is, are we likely to see the same overture from Japan to China to put aside the comfort women and other historical issues? Well, uh, I would hope that uh, the Southeast Asian leaders, together with President Obama, could reaffirm and clarify a kind of normative consensus on the public good of a rules-based order for Asia, uh, and a freedom of navigation and, um, uh, you know, the, those are, and uh, resolution of territorial issues on the basis of international law. And I think, and then discuss how to realize that normative consensus 
through more effective collective action. So that's what I would hope to see. I think President Obama, of course, will also um, enthusiastically support the efforts of ASEAN to strengthen their economic integration and their own collective action, which is uh, progressing quite well and very much in line with U.S. interests as well. So, um, and then maybe set some follow-up actions of how to um, practically realize these aspirations between ASEAN and the United States. So I hope this is not just a one-off uh, event and that we'll see more sustained interaction at the leader level, but also at every other level between the United States and ASEAN. Well, thank you. Uh, well, first of all, uh, I want to say that I don't speak for my government. <laughs> <laughs> it's my personal preference. Uh, I, I do believe that uh, COC is, uh, well, I mean, earlier conclusion of COC is in the best interest of all parties. Okay. Uh, Chinese are still debating among themselves. Okay. There are many Chinese views on this. Um, I think we have spent too much time, uh, too much uh, energy uh, at too much cost. Uh, to, in, to engage in uh, territorial disputes. It's not uh, uh, getting anywhere. Uh, we may end up uh, in conflicts which will cause greater damage to our interests. And I believe it's in China's best interest to focus on uh, one belt, one road, uh, to build connectivity uh, together with Chinese and Southeast Asian neighbors, uh, to, uh, in order to do that, we need to manage this issue well. And the best way to manage it is to have some kind of a code of, code of conduct uh, so that we refrain from taking further uh, actions that may uh, get us in, in trapped in a, in, a, in a spiral of uh, negative interactions. Thank you. Great shot. Uh, uh, Professor Tommy Kaur has raised a very interesting question. Uh, Japanese-Korean relations at the end of the last year, really last year, December 28th or so, uh, two governments or two uh, governments agreed not to make this uh, post-war issue as a continuing political issue between the two countries. Now, this is a rather historic epoch-making decision on the part of both governments. I think both leaders have been, were very uh, courageous in that sense. Uh, of course, the question whether this will be very respected in the future, we don't know, but this is the decision between two governments. They decided that the issue of the past or world war history should be a irreversible. Solution of should be irreversible. Now, I hope this will apply to Japanese China relations. Uh, that is still likely to go on, but the post war issue, 70 years after the end of the war, still the issues are there. I hope that two governments, particularly I'd like to ask the Chinese government, put this kind of post war time issues separate from the main diplomatic issues and let the uh, uh, scholars and others discuss the historical history issues. So that we can go on. There are many things two countries have to work together. But uh, because of these tensions that have been created by the uh, arguments being made primarily by the Chinese side, 
on the post uh, World, uh, World War II issues uh, should be, I hope, to be uh, resolved in an indirect way, not in a straightforward diplomatic issue. Thank you. Thank you. The floor is open. Yes. Manu, ah. uh, morning. Can you hear me? Uh, can you speak up a bit, please? The mic, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, my name is Mano, uh, Chairman. Um, I want to uh, focus, would like the panel to focus for a while on the number one man in China, uh, President Xi. Uh, I think, uh, you know, he, he's a strong, assertive leader, seems to have a lot of support. So, what happens in Southeast Asia, I think, in the years ahead, uh, if he remains in power, will bear a lot on his thinking, his ideas. Uh, we, we've seen him already take a very assertive uh, stand on certain policies, South China Sea, uh, including also, of course, his Belt and, Belt and Road Initiative, his, his approach to Taiwan and, uh, and, and so on in Japan. And I think uh, uh, I would like some insights from the panelists on what, what, is his, what are his objectives. Uh, will, he, will he continue to uh, gather or re retain his support within China because you know, his rather hardline stance on corruption and other areas has also um, give, given rise to some enemies within China against him. So, um, w could, you, could you comment on him and his thinking and, and where he's going to lead uh, China? Was it? Okay. Well, Chinggua. Uh. Well, President Xi is a strong leader. Uh, he had, I mean, uh, he has done what he, what he believes to be uh, right. Uh, and he has advocated rule of law in China. He has advocated reforms uh, in China. Uh, and he has uh, also uh, called for building a community of common destiny. Uh, and he has also uh, uh, been uh, st strong on um, defending China's uh, uh, interests, including maritime inter interests. Um, I think he believes that all these things are right things to do. Okay. Uh, and uh, so far, he has galvanized a lot of support in China. Okay. On territorial issues, um, I think uh, people in different countries have different, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, regard uh, the ter think about territorial issues differently. Okay. Uh, in China, uh, Ch most Chinese believe that the uh, uh, the China's sovereign, uh, China's claims in the South China Sea uh, are, are right. Uh, uh, and China did not enforce such kind of claims as much as it does now because China was too weak. Yeah. Now China has more capabilities, so they demand their government to take more proactive actions. But the problem is, uh, I think in the long run, uh, probably. Uh, uh, the territorial issues are very difficult to resolve. And somehow, uh, 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 you have to be uh, innovative and pra pragmatic uh, in, uh, in addressing these issues. But to ask a national leader to be soft on territorial issues is to demand too much. Thank you. Well, certainly, under Xi Jinping, China is showing its ambition much more overtly. And I think this ambition is natural and inevitable and not something to be feared or worried about, uh, so long as it is expressed in a positive way within this context of 20 neighbors and offering public goods, providing public goods to its neighbors. So 
I'm not really worried about China's ambition or competition between China and the United States over uh, economic diplomacy, One Belt, One Road, Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, all of these sorts of things I think are excellent channels for China to pursue its ambitions in a way that mostly is welcomed by its neighbors, and that should be the litmus test. So, um, you know, I think the United States should not overreact to these kinds of ambitious initiatives on Xi Jinping's part. Uh, let me just say something about Taiwan. Uh, this, uh, President Hu Jintao protected cross-strait policy from the uh, the trends, somewhat, I would say, negative trends of Chinese foreign policy from 2008-2009. And uh, Beijing's approach to cross-strait relations was extremely uh, pragmatic, flexible, and aimed at reassuring the Taiwan public about the benefits of integration with the mainland and, you know, rather than using threats and coercion. So it was a very positive approach. Certainly it benefited U.S.-China relations because we had a, re a relaxed environment, uh, a relationship across the strait. Now with the, uh, uh, the election, upcoming election, which is almost for sure going to bring a DPP president to Taiwan, this is a big challenge for Xi Jinping. And uh, I think that if Xi Jinping is able to sustain a flexible, positive approach across the strait, even with a DPP president, that will send some very positive, reassuring signals to other Asian countries and to the entire international community about uh, the kind of statesman-like uh, Chinese foreign policy. As Jia Qinghua said, uh, you know, the world is looking very carefully to try to come to some conclusions about what kind of global leader China really wants to be. And if it can handle such a delicate issue as cross-strait relations effectively over the next uh, couple of years, I think that will send very, very positive signals. And we should all appreciate how hard this would be to do this well and give China a lot of credit if it manages to do it. Nishihara, would you like to give a Japanese perspective? <laughs> well, the, where should I be? Anyway, the, under Mr. Xi Jinping, we feel strongly that global, uh, uh, China wants to become a global power. That means to push the Americans away from the Asian coast. The discussion that Mr. Xi Jinping had with Mr. Obama back in 2013 to divide the Pacific so that the American can control the eastern part of the Pacific and China will control the western part half of the Pacific. That really worries us because that means US, no US troops in Japan and Korea. That will drastically change the balance with the Pacific and put the, uh, the Asian countries, the very weaker positions. That, therefore, we are concerned about what the Mr. Xi Jinping is really up to, uh, if he could say more clearly about what he wants to build in Asia, in terms of the welfare and the security of Asia. Also, if he could say more clearly about what AIB really wants to be, become in terms of the welfare and also the security of the region. That would be very helpful for us. Thank you. Another question? 
way back. I can't see. The light is a no, bit shining. Yeah, is there yeah, anybody? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. This is Carl Thayer from the University of New South Wales at the Australian Defence Force Academy, and my question is to Professor Jia. In your comments, you said that China doesn't interfere with freedom of navigation on the high seas. Now, the real issue between the U.S. and China is U.S. activities in the exclusive economic zone. But in the South China Sea, no matter what we call what China occupies, an island, a rock, or a low tide elevation, China has not declared baselines. It's not promulgated them. When anybody at the Philippines or the U.S. flies over, they're told they're threatening the security of the Chinese Navy or they're flying into a military or defense security zone. So my question is, your former comments seem to rely on international law and then working out with the U.S. what can happen, military activities in an exclusive economic zone. But in Southeast Asia, what's the basis for claiming when you haven't clarified what your maritime zones are. So how do we know where the high sea is? How do we know what's the territorial sea? Thank you. Well, it's an issue that uh, Chinese are uh, working on it. Uh, we have different views uh, as to how to uh, clarify uh, the territorial uh, and also maritime claims. Uh, uh, in principle, uh, you know, Ch China used to be weak, so we did not uh, uh, get into this legalistic approach. Uh, uh, now, uh, I think uh, people are more aware of how, how to defend their interests through the legal uh, approach. Uh, so, uh, but. Personally, I think it's more a political issue than a legal issue at the moment. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, we need to have more time to, to think through uh, these issues instead of rushing to a decision. I think rushing to a decision is quite dangerous. You never know what comes out of it. <laughs> so uh, uh, a bit patience is necessary if we want to get a better outcome. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Sydney? This is the last question. Uh, thank you very much. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I was curious uh, as to the take of any of the panelists on the impact on Southeast Asia of the growing exodus of Uyghurs. Uh, because it's something that every Southeast Asian country is increasingly feeling. Uh, and I was curious uh, if you could address what you see as the likely developments in Xinjiang and how you see the exodus of Uyghurs uh, uh, that have touched uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, Myanmar, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand affecting Southeast Asia relationships. Thank you. I guess that's addressed to you, Professor Jia. <laughs> uh, well, I noticed a report. Uh, I've read stories about this, but I, I've done, uh, I haven't done much research on this issue. So I do not have any authority to talk on this. But uh, I think it's unfortunate that uh, 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 such, you know, uh, this, this has become a problem. Actually, Chinese police efforts to stop uh, 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 one group from uh, going, uh, Uyghurs of going out of the country uh, led to uh, the massacre in uh, the Kunming railway station by this group. Uh, so originally they planned to go to uh, uh, the Middle East via Southeast Asia, but then the Chinese, somehow the Chinese, they could not get out, so they went to Bay, Kunming police, uh, I mean railway station to kill people. Okay. Um, I think ultimately uh, this issue has to be addressed. Uh, 
through a sophisticated package of, uh, you know, that involves political uh, policies and, and economic policies, and also social policies in Xinjiang. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, a better governance, uh, more efforts have to be uh, introduced you know, to achieve that, that result. But it's, uh, it's a very difficult issue to handle at, at the moment. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have run out of time. I hope you will all join me in thanking the panel.